Um, so the, uh, the problem, <clears throat> like the, what I've been saying is, how do we connect the whole concept of priesthood to us today? How do we connect this idea of what a kind of priest Jesus is to us today? And the idea is there are certain qualifications that God has, that Jesus has to meet in order to be our Savior. It couldn't have been just any random person. It couldn't have been just uh, any random guy. It had to be someone that was this, 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 this. And then Jesus came along and he met all of those qualifications. And because of that, he became the perfect candidate to save the entire world, to be both the person who offers a sacrifice and to be the sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. If Jesus didn't meet the qualifications, he can't be your savior. And so part of all this, when we're looking at what kind of priest he is, we can look at that and say, why do I care about this guy named Melchizedek? Well, part of it is understanding who Jesus is, understanding what kind of Savior he is, understanding the kind of legal, uh, the, I, I say legal, the kind of qualifications in God's mind that Jesus had to meet in order to be our Savior, right? And then that ultimately lets you know that if Jesus had to meet all these qualifications, you have to ask the question, does anyone else meet these qualifications? Because if they don't, they can't be your Savior. And that means if Jesus is the only one that meets the qualifications, he's the only one that saves us. And there's your point. That, that's why he's bringing all this up. He's trying to say... You want to be saved? You want to get to God? you got to go through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Okay, and so that's the point when we're going to be looking at Jesus' priesthood. So let's go ahead and start off with a prayer. Lord Almighty, we thank you, God, for the chance to, uh, to open up your word and to consider your Son. We ask God that we would learn that you would help us to learn more about your son, to learn more about who he is, learn more about what he does for us. We love you, Lord, and we ask God that you would help us to appreciate Jesus, to appreciate the salvation that he offers, to appreciate everything you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, and we ask God that you would give us the strength to pursue pursue Jesus, that we would never let anything get in the way, that we would focus on him and to never stray away that you would give us the clarity and the strength to say no to temptation, that you would give us the strength to say no to Satan, and that even whenever we're suffering, when we're going through trials, when we're having difficulty in life, that our faith would pursue, that we would move through the doubt, and that we would trust you. We love you, Lord. In your Son's name, amen. So, chapter 6. Chapter 6 covered uh, the idea of being certain on God's promises towards the end of chapter 6. And then chapter 7 is going to start talking about what a priest is. And of course, the, the kind of priest we're talking about is not an old covenant priest. Uh, it, the book of Hebrews covers the topic of being a priest a lot. And so far, he's kind of talked about, okay, what is a priest? A priest is someone who ministers sacred things, right? A priest is someone who's authorized by God. A priest is someone who offers sacrifices to God. A priest is someone who mediates between God and man. And Jesus meets all those qualifications. But what, what's the difference between Jesus' priesthood and the old covenant priesthood where they were all in the temple, the tabernacle, sacrificing bulls, sacrificing goats? What's the difference? And that's where we get into in chapter 7. What's the difference between their priesthoods? Because Jesus wasn't a priest like in the temple. He wasn't a Levite. And chapter 7 is going to make that point. And so we look in verses 1 to 10, and we're going to start talking about Melchizedek, right? And he brings up Melchizedek to bring out this point that there is a different kind of priesthood other than what you see in the Old Covenant, other than what you see in the temple. And Jesus is that kind. Verses 11 to 14, he starts talking about, okay, you know that priesthood in the Old Covenant? It really wasn't as great as you think it was. It wasn't perfect. It didn't save you. It didn't bring you closer to God. It served its purpose then and there, but it was not perfect. And then verse 15 to 28 starts talking about, but in the New Covenant, Jesus has this priesthood, and it is 10 million times better than the temple's priesthood, right? So on my PowerPoint today, uh, we're going to have just Scripture, uh, so I'll make my comments, comments independently of that. So, verses 1 and 2. 
<clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So, Melchizedek. If you don't read your Bible carefully, you'll have no idea who this guy is, because he only shows up in uh, three verses in Genesis. Uh, and who would have thought that he became such an important part to our New Testament, considering he's only in four verses in the entire Old Testament? So, in Genesis 14, the story goes this way. There are four kings that decided that they were going to have an alliance against these five kings. The four kings go to war against the five kings. The four kings win against the five kings. The four kings take, all, take plenty of people captive. And one of the people that are taken captive is Lot, Abraham's nephew. So Abraham decides he's going to go save his nephew. So him and his neighboring countries go to war against those four kingdoms. He goes and beats up on those four kingdoms. He saves everyone. And on his way back, after saving Lot, he meets this guy named Melchizedek. And like I said, in Genesis, you only see him three verses. And I'll read it. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of, most, of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So you just see this guy in three verses, and Abraham's on his way after he just defeated, uh, just defeated his enemies in war and saved Lot. And Melchizedek shows up, he offers him bread and wine. That sounds like an allusion to the Lord's Supper there. He, he, he blesses Abram. Abram gives him a tenth of everything. And so built, based on this story, this guy is really, really, really unique. He was a priest, but he was also a king. He was king of his country, but he was a priest. How, I mean, how many other times do you ever see that in the Bible? A priest and a king? That only happens with Jesus. Melchizedek did it, though. You see, this guy was not a Jew, and yet somehow he was a priest of the true God. Isn't that interesting, right? I mean, the, 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 the old covenant priest didn't exist yet, but he was a priest of the true God. Not several gods, not pagan gods, but the true God. His name is Melchizedek. Uh, in Hebrew, that means king of righteousness. And the country that he is uh, king of is Salem. In Hebrew, that means peace. So he's king of peace. Well, I mean, if you heard someone called king of righteousness, you'd think of Jesus. If you heard someone called prince of peace, you'd think of Jesus. Again, there's a lot of foreshadowing here, a lot of, lot, lot of symbolism. Abraham, he blessed Abraham, meaning he had the ability to bless Abraham, meaning God was with him. Abraham gave a tenth of everything to this man. This is one of the first instances of tithing. And that means that Abraham saw something in this guy and gave him a tenth of everything because he thought giving a tenth to this guy was giving a tenth to God. You only tithe, really, to God. And he was tithing to Melchizedek, meaning he recognized that Melchizedek was a priest of God. And so you have three verses on this guy, but literally no one else in the Old Testament is like this guy. And so he's really unique. Who he is is a mystery. I've read so many theories on who this guy is, and that's really not important because I think God left it a mystery on purpose, and he didn't give us much details. And But what he did, you see kind of a foreshadow of Jesus in this guy. And then you get to the Hebrews, and you see that Hebrews is making a point that this guy is connected to Jesus in some way. We get to verse 3. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. So, it, uh, reading this verse, it says Melchizedek is without father or mother or genealogy. 
Now, some people think that that means that Melchizedek was an angel. Melchizedek never died. Melchizedek was literally Jesus before he became human. I don't think that's the point here. I think what he's trying to say is, when you read about Melchizedek, you don't read anything about his mother. You don't read about his father. You don't read his priesthood did not connect to his ancestry. And, and that's a point that we're going to get into in a little bit. The priesthood in the Old Covenant depended upon who your dad was, right? In order to be a priest, what did you have to be? Hmm? A Levite. What about even more specifically? Not all Levites, but son of Aaron. Exactly. And so in the, in the nation of Israel, you had the 13 tribes, right? Levites were the ones that didn't get any land. They were the 13th tribe. And uh, they, uh, within the Levites, instead of getting land, they were given the responsibility to uh, manage the temple and manage the sacrifices and teach uh, the nation of Israel about the law. And within the tribe of Levi, there was the family, the descendants of Aaron. So in order to be a priest, you had to be a Levite, you had to be in the family of Aaron, you had to be a male, you had to be without deformity, and you typically took that upon yourself around 30. You probably served until you were about 50, and it had to be your turn to serve. So a priest in the Old Covenant depended on your lineage. It depended on your ancestry. But when you read about Melchizedek, did it say anything about who his dad was? About his mother? About who his son was? No. You see, in the Old Covenant, you never the, 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 the priests didn't die priests. They weren't priests when they died. When they died, they passed the title on to the next person, didn't they? So the, the title did not stay with him. But well, men, so that means if you don't pass your title on and you die as a priest, you're still that priest, aren't you? I mean, you might be dead, but the title's still on you. And so that's why he's a priest forever. And so you're starting, maybe you're starting to see the connections with Jesus, right? Did Jesus get the, get the priesthood passed on to him? No. Did he pass it on to someone else after he died? No. And so you're starting to see a little bit of the connections. And so we go forward. Verse 4, Abraham gave this guy a tenth of the spoils. And so this is really important in that you see that when one person blesses someone else, who's the superior? Whenever one person gives a tenth to someone else, who's the superior? Right? It's kind of like, I kept thinking of Jesus and John the Baptist, how Jesus came and said, I need you to baptize me. And John the Baptist, John the Baptist was like, no, you need to baptize me, Right? And that's kind of like what you see right here with Melchizedek. I mean, if Abraham was going, if is Abraham the kind of person that would bless or be blessed? Well, Abraham was a friend of God, wasn't he? If Abraham came up to you and asked you to bless him, you'd be like, no, 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 you should be blessing me. Or what about giving a tenth? All right? Abraham came and gave a tenth to Melchizedek. That's his way of saying you're superior to me, right? Let's keep going. Verse 5. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And so the point here is, uh, the point is verse 7. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Right, And so the, 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 the priests would take the tithes in the nation of Israel. Why? Because they're given the responsibility from God. They have this, they're authorized by God. They are superior. They have more authority over you. But now we have the reverse in that Abraham is the inferior here. Abraham is, in all the Old Covenant, Abraham is probably the most prominent person. And he it was the one given the promises from God, and yet he is the one who is giving tithes to someone else. Does that mean someone else is above him? Yeah. Melchizedek was over him. And then Melchizedek blessed Abraham. 
meaning Melchizedek had authority over Abraham. And so now you're starting to see, well, if, if this old covenant priesthood, which descended from Abraham, and then you had Melchizedek's priesthood, and Melchizedek is superior to Abraham, then Melchizedek's priesthood is superior to Abraham's priesthood, which is the Levitical Old Covenant priesthood. You're starting to see, is this making sense, right? Melchizedek was superior to Abraham. That means Melchizedek's priesthood is superior to Abraham's priesthood. And then, whenever you see Jesus come along and he's a priest, well, you've got to ask the question, is he a priesthood along the Levites, along the descendants of Abraham? No, he's a priesthood along the lines of Melchizedek. And so you're starting to understand what kind of qualifications that Jesus meets, what kind of Savior he is, right? Because he is a Savior, not because of who his dad is. He was able to be the Savior of the world, not because of his lineage. You understand that? That had nothing to do with him being able to save the world. It was by his indestructible life, which we'll get to. Is that making sense? This is kind of a confusing concept. If you have a question, let me know. Ready? Right. Yeah, great point. Randy brought out how Melchizedek's priesthood predates Abraham's priesthood and is superior in every way. And back to the context of this letter is that you have Christians who are thinking, well, I'm being persecuted for being a Christian. If I just go back to being a Jew, I can still serve God. Right? And the book of Hebrews is saying, listen, in the New Covenant, you have this amazing priesthood. In the Old Covenant, it's not a great priesthood. That, that, this priesthood of Jesus is a million, infinitely times better than the Old Covenant priesthood. That you can't, just going back is a downgrade. In fact, going back invalidates your salvation, that they're, they're tempted to leave Christ, and he's trying to establish, listen, Jesus is ten times better than all that over there. Why would you go back? I mean, if you had to choose between these two priesthoods, which one would you pick? The better one? Which one's the better one? Jesus. Right, Randy? Uh, a Old Testament forecast to them yeah. would come about. That's a good point. That's a good point. They wouldn't just be leaving the, the temp Yeah, you're right. To go back to Judaism after this would actually be going against Judaism. Because if you're going back to the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant says to move forward to Jesus. And so for them to abandon Jesus and to go back to what they think, they're, they're going back to what they think is the Old Covenant, but the whole Old Covenant said to go forward to Christ when, you had, when, when the opportunity arose. And so they would, in effect, they'd just be simply abandoning Christ and going back to what is just basically their traditions, their misunderstanding of even the Old Covenant. Mike, did you have something? I was just going to add that from a creed, anyway, mm -hmm. there, there were many, Melchizedek was one of those, mm -hmm. um, so... Yep, that's a good point. Melchizedek was in the patriarchal age outside of the Old Covenant. That's a good point. Okay, verse 8, we all oh, start with just verse, let's just read this slide. Verse 7, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So here we have uh, <clears throat> verse 8. Uh, in one case, you have ties received by mortal men, and the other testifies that he lives. Um, this is a little bit of confusing verse in that you have the question, well, is Melchizedek alive or is he dead? Melchizedek is the one that lives. He's contrasted with mortal men. And I think the point we have here is that Melchizedek is mysterious in a way, but also that his, you don't ever read about him dying. You don't, you don't read about him passing on his priesthood. That the idea is that he died with his priesthood and his priesthood stuck with him, meaning he's just an eternal priesthood. And I think the author is kind of playing on the lack of details here, trying to establish that uh, this is a foreshadow of Jesus. You don't read about Melchizedek being having a beginning or an end, because with Jesus, 
He doesn't have a beginning or an end. His priesthood is forever, right? When Aaron died, Eliezer became priest. When Eliezer died, Ithmar became priest. When Ithmar died, Eli became priest. When Eli died, Samuel became priest. And so the priestly position is handed down father to son, to grandson, to great-grandson, but that's not how it is with Melchizedek. He didn't pass on his priesthood, and so his priesthood still stands. That's how it is with Jesus. Jesus, even though he died, he came back to life, he didn't pass on his priesthood. His priesthood still stands, meaning he can still be the Savior of the world. And then verse 9 and 10, um, Levi himself essentially paid tithes, since Levi is the descendant of Abraham. Everything that would become Levi was in the body of Abraham. And this is just one more proof that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. That means Melchizedek is greater than Levi meaning Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than Levi's priesthood. Okay, verse 11 to 14. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. <clears throat> now, this, these two verses are a great demonstration of how salvation didn't come through the Old Covenant. Anyone saved was only saved through Jesus, no matter what time they were born. The Old Covenant does not offer salvation. It says in verse 11 that perfection... If perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, you wouldn't need a change in priests. Meaning, if the Old Covenant priests could bring salvation, you wouldn't need a new priesthood, right? If the old, if the old was good, you wouldn't need the new. And the idea that God bringing about a new means there's something wrong with the old. And, and this is just a common belief that a lot of Christians have, that the Old Covenant is still well and alive today. And it's just not true. These, these verses, I mean, this one's a strong verse, but we're going to see even stronger verses. He says, you know, verse 12, when you have a change in priesthood, you have a change in law. That's as clear as it can get, right? You had to change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, right? If the Old Covenant is still alive today, why don't we have priests in the temple today. We should, but we don't have that. Why? Because the Old Covenant's dead. In the New Covenant, we have Jesus as our high priest. You know, the priests require laws. What is a priest? Who is a priest? What do they do? That's all given up in, in the Old Covenant. You have plenty of that in Leviticus and other books. But if we're going to have a new priesthood, then that means that we need new laws, and there is the new covenant in our New Testament. And so changing the priesthood means changing laws, meaning if Jesus is going to be a priest, and it's not like the old covenant, then he's got to bring in a new covenant. That making sense? That's why we're under the new covenant and not under the old covenant, because no one is under the old covenant, because the old covenant is not valid in God's eyes anymore. Okay, verses 13 and 14. For the one whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe for which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priests. You read the Old Testament and you see that all the priests came from the tribe of Levi. All of them. And so if the priests, well, all of them in the Old Covenant, right? That's why Melchizedek is unique. But Jesus, he's a priest, but what tribe is he from? He's from Judah. And so if Jesus is a priest and he's not from the tribe of Levi, that means he's not a priest in the old covenant. He's a priest in the new covenant. In order for Jesus to be our savior, right? Because this is what we're talking about. When we talk about Jesus being a priest, we're talking about his role in our life, his role in our salvation. In order for Jesus to be a priest, he couldn't have been an Old Covenant priest because the Old Covenant priests did not save anyone. So if Jesus was going to save the world, he couldn't be an Old Covenant priest. He couldn't be a Levitical priest. He had to be a different kind of priest, 
a priest whose priesthood was not dependent upon who his parents were. A priest whose priesthood wasn't passed on to the next generation. He had to be a priest in the way that could save us. And the only path that he could take that, that, to save us was not through the old covenant. It was through bringing in a new covenant. It was being like the priest, like Melchizedek. So his, birth, his priesthood did not depend upon being a son of Joseph or a son of Mary. It depended on him being son of God. You see that? Questions, comments? Okay, verse 15. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, that's Jesus, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Okay, so here, again, he's making the point. He's like, Jesus came along and he was a priest, but not by the legal requirement concerning bodily descent. That means it doesn't matter about him being a descendant of Aaron, being a descendant of whoever. Jesus is a priest by merits of himself, by the merits of what he says, an indestructible life. Because when Aaron died, Eliezer became priest, Eliezer to Ithmar, Ithmar to Eli, Eli to Samuel, and it just goes on and on. When they die, they pass it on. When they die, they pass it on. But Jesus, he doesn't pass it on. Why? Because he doesn't die. When he died, it was for three days. He doesn't permanently die, does he? And so he doesn't need to pass it on. And so in order for Jesus to be the Savior of all time, right? Because how much time has passed since Jesus is dead? 2,000 years? If he was just another person, he would have died several times by then, and he would have had to pass it on, and then pass it on, then pass it on, then pass it on. And so the only answer was that he was immortal, that he was eternal, that he defeated death. His life is indestructible. And that's why when he went back to the right hand of the Father, he is still alive 2,000 years later. He's still there. He's still our Savior. He is still at the right hand of God. Making sense? Okay. Verse 17 and 18. For you are witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right there. See, he's a priest forever because he doesn't die, because he, he never ends. His life does not end. He defeated death, and so death cannot hold him. That's why he's a priest forever. Verse 18. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. I'm going to stop right there. Because if you want, again, if you want a verse that shows we are not under the old covenant, we're under the new covenant, verse 18 and 19, where you go? There are several verses in Hebrews, and this is one of them. These are two verses that just so clearly demonstrate. On the one hand, a former commandment. What is that? That's the commandment that held the priests. That's the old covenant. It is former. How clear can it be? It is set aside. It is weak. It is useless. Verse 19. It doesn't make anyone perfect. It doesn't save anyone. Okay, I mean, is there any question that the Old Covenant is no longer in, open in God's eyes? These verses are so clear. He says, on the one hand, the former commandment, that's the Old Covenant, it was set aside, it is former, it is weak, it is useless, it cannot save. Why would you go back to the Old Covenant? Why would you want to be in the Old Covenant? It doesn't make sense. But as on the other hand, Mike, did you have something? I was going to add the comment that many in the so-called Christian realm, still have priests. Yeah. They haven't read this book. Yeah, right. Or don't understand this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think towards the end of Hebrews, he makes the point that there are priests in the New Covenant. You know who the priests are? All of us. Jesus is our high priest, but every single person in the New Covenant is a priest. First Peter 2, 9 says we are a royal priest priesthood. All of us are priests. And the idea that we have, have a priest, I'm sorry, we don't need a priest. We don't need someone between us and God. That's Jesus's role, right? That was a good, good mention. That, I mean, whenever Christian groups try to have priests in, 
in their religion, they're trying to bring a piece of the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. And the Old Covenant was set aside. Why are you bringing it back? Mike? Yeah, there's a concept of laity versus clergy. Yeah. And, and you know, that is just not biblical. Absolutely. There's no difference between laity and clergy in God's Word. There isn't. So verse 19, so he's, he knows the contrast in verse 18. So on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, whereas on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. One is set aside, one is introduced. One is weak and useless, the other you can draw near to God. In the new covenant, you can draw near to God. In the temple, with all those priests, guess what? You couldn't get close to God. But here, through Jesus, you can get close to God. And so, and so why would you ever abandon Jesus? You can't get it anywhere else. Verse 20 and 21. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was, who, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So, uh, Chapter 6 made a big point about God's promises. When God makes a promise, I mean, it is for sure. I mean, anytime God says something, it's for sure. But whenever God makes a promise, that is doubly, doubly, doubly for sure, right? And so here, uh, all the priests in the Old Covenant, they came in, they were appointed, they were instituted, but they didn't get a promise from God. But Jesus, Psalm 110, I think that's verse 4, that's quoted, is referring to Jesus saying, you are a priest forever. I will not change my mind. How serious is it when God says, I'm not going to change my mind? That's pretty serious. And so God said, Jesus, you are my priest. I am not going to change my mind. I mean... Is there anything more sure you can be about? Is there anything more confident? Is there anything more permanent than God saying, this is how it is, I will not change my mind? That's incredible. And he said that about Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world all the way until the end of this world. There is no replacing him. There is no end to his work. He's a priest forever. He's not going to pass it on to someone else. It's not like someone else is going to come in and bring a whole new covenant. That's not what it's going to happen. This, he is a priest forever, all the way up until the end of the world. This is the final stage of God's plan. Mike, did you have something? I just want to amplify verse 19. We can draw near to God. I think that's a really, really powerful point. And we've mm -hmm. heard in other places that God will dwell in us. Mm -hmm. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yep. The curtain between the most holy place and the holy place was torn from top to bottom at Jesus' death. Right. So there's just tremendous points about drawing near to God, and, and, and God wants to be in us. Yeah, for sure. Great. There's a lot more to say about that. Wish we had the time. We're going to try and finish this chapter. I think we can get through it. We don't got much, too much left. <clears throat> Verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. So, verse 22, he's the guarantor of a better covenant. He is the assurance. He's the pledge. He's the one that makes sure what is promised is given. He's the person in the covenant. Remember, a covenant is a mixture of a contract, a promise, and a relationship. The, the best example of a covenant is a marriage today. It's a relationship, but it's also very contractual legally, and you say, we're going to take care of each other, and that's that promise there saying, we're going to love each other and be with each other. That's the idea of a covenant. It is a relationship, a contract, and a promise. And so in this promise, Jesus is the guarantor, meaning he's going to make sure that it's taken care of. He's the one in the middle of the covenant making sure, saying, I'm going to make sure that this promise is kept, right? And God made the promise. Again, he made the covenant, Right, And so verse 24, he's contrasting verse 23 to 24 and 25. Right there. We got more to cover. I thought this, this chapter was short. 
Jesus is one, whereas all the priests are many, right? And so Jesus being a priest forever, meaning he's not going to die and pass on his title, means there only needs to be one, right? Whereas the priests were many in number. And so that was, and that only shows more weakness, right? But Jesus, he's going to continue in office forever. You see, his priesthood, and when I say his priesthood, remember, his ministry of saving us, his work in saving us, it is permanent. He is going to hold this position forever. Ever. Verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And th these two verses are kind of the application. Why do I care? that Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek was a priest. Why do I care about that? Because of this. Because Jesus is able to save to the uttermost, to the ends of the earth, to the end of all time. He's able to save. He's able to be the in-between between us and God. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus was the right kind of priest, he wouldn't have been able to save us. Right, He had to be the right kind of priest. In the Old Covenant, those priests couldn't save. So he had to be a different kind of priest. Verse 26, it was fitting, it was appropriate, it was required that Jesus was checked all these boxes. If Jesus wants to be the Savior of the world, he had to check all these boxes. He had to be a high priest who was holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, and all the ones that we've named so far in the book of Hebrews. He had to meet all these qualifications to become our Savior. He couldn't have just been anybody. He had to be the right kind of priest. He had to be the right kind of person. He had to do the right kind of things. And Jesus met all those qualifications. And the, really the important part is no one else did. And so salvation comes through Jesus in Jesus alone. Let's go ahead and finish the chapter, verse 27 and 28. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has made, been made perfect forever. Here in these verses, we start talking about the sacrifice Jesus offered. He offered one, whereas the priests in the Old Covenant offer multiple. We'll get more into that in future chapters. And I will end there. Thank you, guys.